James chapter 5. Started James, I think, back before we actually got back together. Started James uh, when we were recording here in the empty auditorium. So it's been a few months. And uh, just looking at James as a whole and the instruction of James to, uh, to the Christians. Uh, James was written very early in the church's history and gives us great instruction on how to live in a practical sense, in a practical sense. There's not a lot of theological doctrine in the book of James. It's more practical living, how to live the Christian life, if you will. And so we've come now to the end of James, and we're uh, at, actually at verse number 13 is where we are. And we're going to read through from 13 through verse 20, and then talk a little bit about that, about praying in tough times. So James chapter 5, verse number 13 through verse number 20, and we'll go ahead and read down through those, and then come back to the beginning of that. And verse number 13 says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, that is Elijah, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth, by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the air of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Um, here at the end of, of James, James is getting into prayer a little bit, talking about prayer. And as we close out the book, you'll notice that it is the common theme of the last verses of this chapter. Uh, the passage speaks about prayer, and much of it is actually about prayer for others. Prayer for others. Um, it was... Yeah, if I was to encapsulate the major thought of these verses, I would do so with the sentence in verse 16, where it says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's really the thought of this last part of the book of James, is the power of prayer. The power of prayer. Now, just for some ideas and definitions, when it talks about effectual, fervent prayer... In the Greek language, that word fervent is the same word we get the English word energy from. Energy. And what he's talking about is a prayer that is filled not just with words, but a prayer that is filled with some sort of energy from us, or some sort of force from us, something that is more than just what we repeat. Now we often pray for our food uh, 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 when, when we're getting ready to eat, and we may just say some words that come very easily or maybe say some things that are somewhat repetitious. And there may be words and intent behind them, but oftentimes it's, Lord, thank you for the food, bless our bodies, let's have a good day, amen, you know? And that's all there is to it. And, and in reality, I think our intentions are good, and there's not a lot of, shall we say, oomph behind that. We're just asking the Lord, bless the food. But sometimes our prayers become like that overall. Our prayers just kind of, get to a point where they become either very repetitious or they become very empty and we may pray out of some feeling of obligation toward the Lord or something that we know is, is important to do in our life so we do it. Yet what the Bible is encouraging here, what the Bible is telling us here, is effectual prayer, is fervent prayer. It's prayer that has some energy or some desire behind it to seek the Lord. When I think of that thought, I'm reminded of, of when Jacob wrestled with God after he came over uh, the, the river and he was coming back to his homeland after he had left, uh, after he'd left the land he'd been in for 20 years and was coming back home to face his brother Esau from whom he had stolen something 20 years previous and Esau had threatened to kill him. And now he was coming back home and the Bible says that he met a man 
that met with him and wrestled with him that night. Wrestled with him all night. And the man said to Jacob, he said, Jacob, let me go. And Jacob's response was, I will not let you go unless you bless me. When I think of fervency in prayer, I'm thinking of that, that, that type of idea that as a Christian, we're encouraged not just to pray, but to have a fervent desire, a hot, energetic desire to see God do something that drives us to seek his face. The life of the Christian is to be one of fervent prayer. Prayer for oneself, yes, but also prayer for others. Prayer is our lifeline to God, and as we grow in faith, prayer should become something that is easier for us to do. Our dedication to prayer is a hallmark of our maturity in the Christian life. As we grow closer in our relationship with God, our prayers should become more intimate and real. It's the same that we can say with God and our relationship with God as we say with our relationship with others. The word intimate and intimacy means very familiar, close, or that which is on the innermost or made known. Intimacy in our relationship is, is linked with the closeness that we have with somebody. The closer we are with someone, the more intimate or the more familiar, the more open our relationship is with that person. And by extension, the more open we are with somebody, the more often we will communicate with them and the more often we will speak to them about things that are of utmost importance and the same is true with our Lord. The closer we are to the Lord, the more familiar we are with the Lord, the more we're willing to engage in prayer with our Lord. And the less we are with God, the less we'll come to the Lord in prayer. When we draw back from someone, one of the things that suffers first is our communication. Isn't it true? When you start to feel a distance between somebody, maybe you see them somewhere and you try to be friendly with them and they seem a little distant or closed with you, you know that something's going on in a relationship. Even if it's not been extremely expressed explicitly, you may feel that something's going on. Or maybe it has been and somebody has told you to your face that they don't really like you or there's something there in between your relationship. And it's the first, one of the first things that suffers is our communication at that point. We don't want to talk to them anymore. We don't want to see them anymore. We would rather we see them when we walk a different direction. We don't want to really engage with them anymore. And the same is true with God. The farther we are from the Lord, the less our prayers and communication with Him will be. God encourages us to pray, not just pray, but pray fervently, verse 16 tells us. It says uh, in verse 16, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then he gives us an illustration of that type of praying. Look at verses 17 and 18, and then we'll go back up to verse 13. We're getting this context here. Look at verse 17 and 18. He says, Elias, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. He prayed earnestly. What was that? Earnestly, that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now we read the story about Elijah, and we go back to the Old Testament, we can read it, and we'll read that Elijah prayed, and oftentimes when we read that, we think, oh, Elijah was so close to the Lord, Elijah just kind of told God, God, make it stop raining, God made it stop raining. But that's really not the picture that's being given here. It says Elijah, first of all, was a man just like you and I are. He wasn't any different than you and I. Yes, he was called to be a prophet of God. And yes, God spoke to Elijah. And God worked greatly through Elijah. But he was like you and me. He was made of the same stuff. Elijah wasn't a superhuman. He was human just like you and I are. Elijah was subject, the Bible says, to the same passions as we are. That means he, he endured the same afflictions, the same problems, the same uh, temptations. He went through things just like you and I did. The same way. He no doubt dealt with the same doubts that you and I dealt with. Do you ever pray and doubt that God's, not that God's able, but that God's willing? Does that ever happen? Say, Lord, would you do this to me and in your heart, or do this for me, or do this in this world, and in your heart you doubt whether or not God will 
Not that God can. We know God can. I can just picture Elijah praying and asking God uh, to, to, to stop the rain and cause a drought for three and a half years. Yes, Israel was in a great, uh, trapped in great sin at that time and the very wicked nation at that time. The Bible doesn't say he just prayed. It says he prayed earnestly. It was a great desire and, and longevity. He prayed that it might not rain, and it rained not for the earth by the space of three years and six months. And then we read verse 18. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain. And we, th and we may read that and think, oh yeah, Elijah just said, God, make it rain, and God made it rain. Not really. In fact, it took Elijah seven times of praying before God sent the rain. Seven times he prayed. Seven times before God caused it to start raining again. And yes, I'm not saying that I'm not saying that God, or no, no, I'm not saying that God will answer our prayer simply because we pray seven times. But what I'm saying is this: we need an earnestness in our prayer, and an effectual fervency in our prayer, and a desire that will cause us to continue to ask until God moves on our behalf. And so here it is: James comes into this idea of prayer with this illustration. Gives us an illustration of Elijah and then gives us some things about which to pray. Things over we ought to be praying. Look at verse 13 if you would. He gives us here to pray for comfort in our affliction. Notice it says in verse 13, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Uh, here you see two aspects of the Christian's life. Uh, a life of affliction and a life of merriment. But in reality, we can have a song in our heart no matter what we're going through. We can. We can have a song no matter how dark the days are, or no matter how difficult the days are. We can have a song in our heart and we bring our burdens to the Lord. On the one hand, we see the Christian's response to affliction, that is prayer. On the other hand, we see the Christian's response to merriment, that is singing and praising God. But wouldn't it be great if we were to take those two together and that was our life all the time, a life of prayer and a life of song to the Lord? I love taking the time to sing songs like we did tonight where folks can express the songs that are on their hearts. I love to hear the song choices, and sometimes our song choices reflect what's going on in our hearts at the moment. And songs mean different things to us at different times in our life, and songs of merriment, yes, are enjoyable, but songs in the times of affliction are enjoyable too. And prayer and affliction is very powerful, but so is prayer in times of great merriment too. Our prayer should not be limited to spare tire praying. The thing about spare tire praying is we pray when things are dark and we don't pray when things are bright. Pray when things are tough and we forget to pray when things are good. But during our times of affliction, we ought to run to the Lord. If we are suffering in life, that is not the time to draw back from God. That is the time to draw closer to God. When I'm going through the tough times, when you're going through the tough times, that's not the time to allow something to become a wedge between us and God. That is the time to go to the Lord for the strength that we need because God is our strength. He is our stay. God is our rock. God is our fortress. And He is our shield. God can calm the stormy seas. God can touch the brokenhearted. God can heal the hurting. God can raise the dead. And if God can do all those things, God can work in my life. In my affliction as well. God can furnish a table in the wilderness. God can send manna from heaven. God can make water come out of a flinty rock. And if God can do those things, God can comfort me in my affliction. Are you afflicted today or suffering? The question must be asked, have you prayed earnestly? One of the things that I struggle with, and maybe many others do as well, is sometimes we get, I get, a go-it-alone mentality. It's that mentality that I'm going to make it through life no matter how difficult it is, and if it means I've got to do it all by myself, I'm going to do it all by myself. And when things get tough, and when things get strained, or when the schedule gets tight, or something comes into my life, my first response often is, I'm going to solve it all by myself. Maybe you're like I am. I know I'm that way. And it's easy to get it in your head, in my head that 
I can figure it out. Just give me enough time and give me enough resource and I can figure out what we're going to do. But you know, we've heard the statement, God will never give you more than you can handle. The truth of the matter is, God will never give you more than he can handle. There are times that God will allow things to enter our lives to remind us that we need Him. I'm reminded, I mentioned that God can calm the stormy seas. I, I love the story when, it is when, when the disciples are with Jesus out on the, on the boat. And as they're going across that lake, the Bible says a storm came up and it was very common. It still is in that lake for storms to come out of nowhere. They were crossing this, this, the, 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 the sea, that lake there, and the storm came up. And the Bible says they rode against the storm, and they tried very hard to, to push against the storm. And they realized at that moment that if something didn't happen, their lives would be forfeit. They'd die. And so they turned to Jesus to ask Jesus for help. And you know what Jesus was doing? He was sleeping in the boat. Now, the honest, simple truth is by themselves, those skilled fishermen could not handle that storm. But with Jesus, they surely could. And God will often bring us to that point in our life to remind us that he is in control of everything. And it's made it such that we need him to move forward. We can try, we can try to work it out on our own, we can do everything in the power that we can, but we will come up short if we do not go to God. We will. We will come up short if we do not go to God. There's no problem too big for God, there's no problem too small for God. So God reminds us, if we're in affliction, we need to be praying. What's great about that is if we're in connection with the Lord... We can have a song in our heart and go forward even in our affliction and suffering knowing that God is by our side. We read Psalm 23 this morning that says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. And in our greatest afflictions, we are to draw close to the Lord in fervent prayer. Not saying God will remove our affliction, but God will give us the strength and the faith and the patience to continue on. Through our affliction with a song in our heart. He says, Are any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Verse 13, Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. And then verse 14, we prayer, fervent prayer brings comfort in our affliction. Verse 14, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Let me say, first of all, just like, just like affliction, God does not always guarantee that we will receive healing from what it is that we have been, uh, that, that is troubling us. He is not guaranteeing that we will always receive healing, but he is saying, in our moments of sickness, we need to be in fervent prayer with him. Paul prayed more than once that God would remove the physical ailment that he had, and God chose not to remove it. But God gave Paul peace to walk on in his life with God's strength through it. But here we are encouraged when we are sick to call for the elders of church that they may anoint them in the name of the Lord and pray over them. We see God instructing us how to handle our sicknesses. Notice the Bible says right here, is any sick among you? Verse 14, let him call for the elders of the church. There's any time to be connected to the church, it should be a time of sickness. Time of sickness. It should be. It is never a burden to call when sickness has come. It is never a burden to call when someone is in the hospital. It's never a burden to the church. It should never be a burden to the church to pray for someone in their sickness. This is not a burden. This is God's plan. The Bible says, call for the elders of the church. They may come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. I want you to notice verses 14 and 15 and what it says here, because 
there's some little bit of misunderstanding about what these verses mean. Verse 14 says, Let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Let me say, first of all, what this verse is not saying. This verse is not saying that whenever someone is sick, it's because they've sinned. It's not saying that. Oftentimes we associate negative aspects in our life with sin because the Bible talks about God's hatred of sin and the Bible talks about God's judgment on sin. And we know that God hates sin and we know that God does judge. We know that God does punish at times. We know that God does correct at times. And there are things that enter into our lives that break our relationship with the Lord and sometimes we suffer consequence for our sin. That is true. But not every sickness is because of sin. Not every ailment is because of sin. The Bible's not saying that. There are times we get sick because we get sick and God just allows it to happen. There are times that we are injured in this life and God just allows it to happen. I remember having a conversation with somebody years back when I was a teenager. And we were talking about uh, something that happened to somebody. They were in, a, they were in an automobile accident and... We were, we were talking about the uh, occurrence, and, and I, in my, in my teenage mind, said to him, I said, you know, God must be really trying to get their attention. You know that, right? And he said to me, how do you know that? I said, well, he got an accident, right? He said, well, we know, we know he got an accident, but what is God trying to tell him? I said, well, I, I, I don't know. What is God trying to tell him? He said, I don't know either. Maybe God did not try and tell him anything. Maybe God's allowing something to happen so... Their faith can increase in Him. And there are times negative things that happen in our life. It's not because of sin necessarily. But the Bible does tell us here that as someone who is sick, we ought to be considering the fact that our relationship with the Lord needs to be good. Sin becomes a barrier in our fellowship with God. It does. The Bible reminds us in 1 John to confess our sins so that, and, and as we do, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But just like in any relationship, when we violate our relationship with somebody and we do something that harms our relationship, the right thing to do is to make it right. And if we don't, that remains in our relationship to be dealt with. Now, thankfully, God is a God of the second chance, the third chance, the fourth chance. The fifth chance, the seventeenth chance, the seven hundredth chance, our God's a good God. But he reminds us, man, when we're in that moment of affliction and sickness, let us consider our lives and let us make our accounts right with the Lord because we want our effectual prayers to have some effect in our lives. So God is not saying here that are all every time that we are sick, it's because we sin. God is not saying here that He's going to heal. In fact, what does it say? It says, Let them pray over Him, anointing Him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. That word save means deliver, and the Lord shall raise Him up. The Lord can raise Him up, but sometimes it raises Him up while they're still sick and gives Him the strength to continue on, like I said. God can give us grace and give us the strength to continue on even when our bodies are frail and weak. He can do that. Now, of course, we want deliverance from the sickness. We would rather have that thing removed from our life. But God does encourage us in those times to pray earnestly, but not just to pray earnestly, to call others to pray as well. Verse 14, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now let me say, that's a practice that I've done in the past. The pastor in the past, I used to have carry oil with me, and folks sometimes would ask, could you come anoint us with oil, and we'd pray. Now let me just say, that is nothing magical in the oil at all. It's not a magic potion or anything like that. That oil is very symbolic. What that's talking about is the strength and power of the Holy Ghost. Oil in the Bible is often a picture of the Holy Spirit. 
working in our lives. And you read about the oil in the, in, when Jesus gives the parable of the Good Samaritan, they bound him up with oil. What that's talking about is the, is the Holy Spirit's power working through our lives and moving in our lives. It's the Holy Spirit that does the healing. No special magic power in any oil in the world. Uh, I've seen, I've seen on TV, uh, these people they're selling little bottles of holy oil, miracle oil, and things like that. Let me just say that that is not a biblical concept. God is the one that is holy. God is the one that works. And sadly, folks who have a great desire to see God work are oftentimes pulled into that, and they and they spend money on something that's just normal oil. I was reading about a fellow. Who, who was claiming that, that holy oil was dripping out of his Bible and that, that anyone that had that oil would, would receive great miracles from the Lord. And, and, uh, and I know I've shared this with my family, but I read a few months ago. And he had a Bible that was covered in, in oil. And the folks were just amazed and people were flocking around. Uh, and, and they were selling the oil and, 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 and claiming it was miracle oil. And so a reporter came into town to, to investigate what was going on. And actually ended up getting a sample of that oil and took it out and had it analyzed and found out it was just mineral oil. And as the uh, in investigator was started probing into things, found out the fellow was going down to the tractor supply company and buying mineral oil. <laughs> selling it as holy oil. It heal all your ailments. Because people read things like that and they start to get a misconception about what it's saying. What it's saying, though, is this. When you're sick, reach out to the folks in the church and ask the elders, the pastors, deacons to come and pray and ask God to move on your behalf. God can deliver you from your sickness. God can raise you up. Now, is that a guarantee? No. It also says, it's not a guarantee of healing. It's a guarantee that God will work. God will work. God works. It's not a guarantee of healing, but God will raise us up. And then if any of us committed sins, we have to be seeking God to forgive us of our sins, that they're not a block in between us and our relationship with God. And then lastly, he says in verse number 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Gives us that example again of Elijah that we always already read. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. It rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. He prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. In verse 19, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. The last thing it talks about there is our failures and our shortcomings and how we have to be praying over those. It says, confess your faults one to another. What does that mean? It simply means this. That word fault means to miss the mark or to come up short. We all have shortcomings. Every one of us does. We all come up short sometimes. We're not perfect people. We have our frailties. We have our weaknesses. We don't always hit what we're supposed to hit in life. Often we miss the mark. Often we come up short, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. We're all sinners in that way. But the Bible is encouraging us in this passage of Scripture that prayer over our shortcomings, and especially prayer from others over our shortcoming, is very powerful. Very powerful indeed. God's reminding us that we don't have to fight the battles of this life alone. The devil's very good at isolating us and making us feel as though no one is really on our side. He's very good at convincing us that everyone else has everything put together and we're the only one that struggles. The devil's very good at convincing us that everyone else is an adversary at times, and that no one else goes through the things that we uh, go through. It's one reason, by the way, church is so important. It brings us together and reminds us that we are all here for one another, every single one of us. But when it comes to this right here, God says there are times when our shortcomings, we'll pray for our shortcomings, and we'll pray for our shortcomings. It seems like we always come up short. 
Sometimes what we need to do is find someone we can confide in and say, can you pray with me over what it is I'm struggling with? Can you pray with me over what it is I'm struggling with? And together, go to the Lord in prayer, asking God to work on our behalf. Maybe we struggle with our temperament at times. Maybe we struggle with something in our life and we need some accountability and we ask somebody to share in prayer with us that together we may go to the Lord and ask God for his strength. I will say when sharing prayer requests, I give some advice about it. Uh, we need to be, do so with some wisdom. Be careful sometimes who it is we share and who it is to whom it is we share and what it is we share. Sometimes there's some well-meaning people in our lives who want so much for God to answer our requests that they will share our requests with others when we don't want them to. So we need to be very careful sometimes those with whom we confide. Be very careful about sharing information. If someone comes to you and asks you to pray for them, I'd be very careful about sharing that if they haven't said specifically that we can share it with somebody. I'll give you a little illustration about that. Years ago, I had a pastor friend of mine who sat down. We were talking, just, just chit-chatting and such, and, and uh, nothing serious, just having a, a conversation. And he says to me, he says, hey, could you pray for so-and-so? I said, sure, we'd love to pray for that person. He said, yeah, he's, he's considering changing his jobs and, and, and leaving the place where he's working now and moving to another place to go to work. I thought, oh, that, yeah, I'd be happy to pray for him. And so put that down and prayed for him. And then a weekend or two later, we were having a church picnic and I uh, went up to him and I said, hey, brother, I heard that you're changing jobs. I just want to let you know I was praying for you. And he looked around and he said, who told you that? He said, I haven't even told my whole family that yet. <laughs> he said, told my wife and kids, I haven't even told my mom and dad. And they were just right over across the pavilion from us. He said, who told you that? And I said, brother, I'm sorry. I said, oh, somebody told me that. And I assumed because they told me everyone else knew. And we had a little conversation about that. But God encourages us in our times of weaknesses, in our times of afflictions, when we're suffering, to go to others and ask them to help us pray over those things that we're struggling. We need to be careful. Prayer requests don't become gossip between other people. We need to be careful that those with whom we share things will be held in confidence if they give it to us and they want us to hold it in confidence. But that aside, it's a powerful thing when we have others praying on our behalf. When we're struggling in life, often we don't want to talk to people about it much. We like to keep that facade that everything is all in the proper place and everything's all in order and we've got it all put together and everything's good. But when we do, we miss out on the blessing of prayer together over those things that maybe we're struggling with. It reminds us the last two verses, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. And that's really what it is all about when we pray for the weaknesses of other people. It's not a way of humiliating them or a way of putting them down, but a way of trying to strengthen and encourage and bring them back to the Lord so that they don't continue to struggle the rest of their life and fall away from the Lord talks about saving a soul from death and hiding a multitude of sin. We do know that folks who are saved are saved eternally, but there are many folks who get saved and then their spiritual life seems to shrivel up and fade away because of something they're struggling with. And if we can pray for one another and encourage one another and bring other people along and go a long way to helping people continue on in their Christian struggle and their Christian life. So again, we're encouraged here in the end of James to pray, to pray fervently, to pray in our affliction, to rejoice and sing songs with merriment. And we can have that merriment even during those times of affliction as we go to the Lord for pray, for in prayer for strength. We're reminded when we're sick to call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, knowing that the Lord can heal. And if the Lord chooses not to heal, that he can raise us up. Again, I'm not saying... There's, when the Bible says that God can raise us up or God will raise us up, 
I'm not saying there's no guarantee of God working. I'm saying there's no guarantee God's going to heal exactly what we ask. But God can raise us up, even in our, Ill, even in our illness and even in those difficult times in our life. And then we're encouraged to go to others with our faults and weaknesses to someone that we can truly trust and ask them to pray for us and help us in prayer that we may see God working on our behalf and helping us in our difficult times. Let us pray. Pray. Pray in our affliction. Pray for one another. And pray for strength. And let us pray this evening. Father, again, we come to you tonight thanking you that we have that avenue to prayer to you that even in our darkest times and our most difficult times as we're struggling and as we're facing the difficult times of life and times of sickness and times of affliction, in times of weakness when we come up short, when we're trying so hard to do what is right, you encourage us to pray, to pray. There's nothing too big for you. There's nothing too small for you that we may seem overwhelmed in this life, but we know, Lord, that you have the strength to pull us through. I thank you, Father, that your will is greater than ours, that your desire is greater than ours, that your plan is greater than ours, and that you allow us to come to you and see you work in those areas in our life in very great and mighty ways. Thank you, Lord, that we have that connection. And Lord, if there is something in our life that is blocking that connection to you that comes up as a barrier between you as we read. Father, I pray that you would help us to confess and forsake it, that we may find the forgiveness, Lord, to, that is so richly poured out from you upon us. We do ask again for your strength, Lord, in our sickness and our weakness and our frailties. And we thank you for your presence by our side always. We pray, Lord, for this week that you would give us a good week and that you would bring us all back again soon, that we may fellowship together, rejoice together, and, Lord, grow together as well. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.